Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 268 of the All Dolphins podcast on this wonderful, sunny, beautiful March. No, April 17th, 2024. Already messing up. I'm a mess. Anyway, uh, as you can see by the gentleman between Omar and I, we are joined today by special guest Simon Clancy. We're going to be talking some things draft, as you see his Twitter handle. Simon not only is a uh, uh, co-host on the Three Yards Per Carry podcast, part of the Five Reasons Network. Simon also does an annual draft guide, which is very well researched, very well written, um, and always a must read. And you can get a copy of said draft guide by DMing uh, Simon at his uh, Twitter handle, as you can see, sorry, his X handle at Cy Clancy. Simon, um, thank you for joining us. How many no words is your draft guide, Simon? I saw you post it the other day. It's currently, it's 122,600, and there's about 330 prospects in there. 330 prospects. Now, I'm going to hit you with the question that that we asked Chris Greer. How many legit first-rounders do you think that there are? Oh, good question. I haven't actually worked that out. I would say there's probably about, I mean, it's a good year. There's some really good depth, at really, you know, corner, offensive tackle, um, wide receiver. Obviously, I'd say there's a there's, there's 20, 22, 23, maybe really good guys. I would, and then there's a group of guys that maybe you wouldn't spend in the first round, but I would absolutely bang the table for in terms of you know if I was in that draft room, I'd be saying, look, this guy is absolute value and is going to help your team. So yeah, there's there, there's good players in this draft. Okay, he said there's about 15, 16, and he right. surveyed a lot of teams, and and that's generally what their list is. But then you know other guys and other positions are going to be pushed up. Let let me let me hit you with the one that that most people how most people want to know because you know they think that quarterbacks are the only things that sell the draft. How many first rounders are there, and where do you think they'll they'll end up? Uh, first round quarterback. So obviously Caleb Williams, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jaden Daniels. I think they'll go one and two. I think Drake may is a first round quarterback, although I think there is, uh, uh, I, whilst I think he's kind of akin to the sort of the aliens that are dominating this game in terms of Mahomes and Allen and Herbert, when you look at the size and the arm, I think that there is a bit of a reckless tendency to his game that will have to be curbed. And I think he'll probably take a little bit m more time to come to the fore. I love Michael Penix. I think that Penix is a first round pick and I suspect he'll get taken as such. And we talked about this off air, but I would say the Raiders are a landing spot. I would say the Seahawks are a landing spot, especially when you consider that his offensive coordinator in Washington, Ryan Grubb, is now the Seahawks offensive coordinator. And I mean, he is he is surrounded, yes, by elite level NFL talent, but he makes spectacular throws as a pure pocket passer and he has some difficulties out of structure and off platform where we heard that before, but when he's on yeah, time yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and he, well, oddly, I, and I've put it in the draft book, he, he oddly reminds me of Tua in many respects. Of course, he's significantly more toolsy. He has a much bigger arm, but in terms of the play style, in terms of the accuracy, the touch, the confidence in the scheme, and then the flip side, the struggles out of structure, the accuracy slippage when he's moved from his landmark or he's pressured constantly, the similarities are strong, but to me, he's a first-round player. I, I struggle a little bit with JJ McCarthy, but I I do understand why he's going to go in the first round. I mean, he's got a very big arm, which we haven't seen that much of. He's very consistent, but he was a point-and-shoot passer in a pretty moribund offense at, at Michigan. So you have to ask whether or not that was that was holding him back. He didn't play very much in fourth quarters of games because Michigan was so far ahead, um, and I think he'll go in the top. Five. I mean, I wouldn't take him in the top five, but and it wouldn't He's surprise me. He's going in the top five, JJ. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think the Patriots might take him at three. I think the Vikings might. Somebody would. Teams will start moving up because they won't want to miss out. Now, is he value there? Not for me. But the three. There, there are three players who I have heard who have done unbelievable jobs in this sort of draft season in terms of selling themselves. Yeah, but also being in the room with teams. And being on the board and in terms of their leadership and their maturity and how they understand the game. JJ McCarthy is one of them. Brian Thomas is another. And then there's a defensive back, uh, Cole Bishop out of Utah, who are the three players who, are, who I've been told have absolutely blown teams away. McCarthy, essentially, when he was growing up, he was an absolute football nerd. He grew up with a whiteboard in his basement. And, and as a seven, eight, nine-year-old, he'd go down and diagram plays. He was constantly scribbling sort of football related thoughts in a notebook. He's just turned 21. You know, he is a, um, he's somebody that I think teams think in terms of the intangibles 
could be a good quarterback for them. And then beyond that, I don't think Bo Nix is a first rounder, um, but he may go in the first round. Uh, and after that, that's that 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 to me is where it stops. So I think there are four first round quarterbacks, and I think they will go probably within the top fifteen picks. The one caveat is some team might trade up into the back end of round one to take Knicks because of the fifth year contract. A question for you, if I may follow up. Um, you said it ends at Bo Nix. You don't have a Brock Purdy in this draft. Who who could who could be one of those day two or day three guys that just absolutely takes over the league? Yeah, I'm not sure about takes over. The, I, I really I I have very much enjoyed watching Spencer Rattler play. I think he's a little bit undersized, but I think he's got good talent. He's got a live arm. He was an immature kid at Oklahoma. I don't know if anybody listening or watching saw the QB1 documentary series on Netflix where he just came across as a terrible, terrible person as the number one high school re- recruit in the in the country. And I think he was humbled a bit by, by his downfall and what happened to Oklahoma in terms of Caleb Williams coming in and, hit, in and him having to go to South Carolina. And he sort of rebuilt himself and grew up on this second chance in the SEC. He can put the ball anywhere. I thought he was excellent at the senior bowl. He's just a bit inconsistent. I, I think if he could overcome some of the issues that he have, and a lot of them are pre-snap, just in terms of identification of pressure, those sorts of things. If he could identify, if he could overcome some of those inconsistencies, he could be anything he wants to be. I mean, he's only six foot one, but he has got a live arm. Um, I, I like him a lot. Beyond that, uh, Jordan Travis is interesting, but I don't think he's got the arm enough to. To, to be a starter. The kid at Tulane, Michael Pratt, is interesting in terms of, you know, 44 starts at Tulane. He's kind of a safe, solid, mid-round guy for a team looking for a, a touch passer, a bit like a sort of, a I don't know, Dollar General Kirk Cousins in terms of, I don't know whether he's got the tools to be a top half of the NFL starter. <laughs> and then, you know, I like that on, term there. Yeah. How do you know about our Dollar General? I mean, <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to a Dollar General or two in my time. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the other guy that I, I find quite intriguing is um, Gus Bradley's son, Carter Bradley, who's the Toledo transfer who goes to South Alabama. He's got a big arm. Uh, and he's a sort of late round developmental pick because of the arm talent. He's grown up around quarterbacks because of his dad. So he's, you know, grown up around Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers and Peyton Manning and Trevor Lawrence. So he understands the mindset and the mentality of what it's like to be an NFL quarterback. And he has some ability to whip the ball over the lot. So I think, you know, he is an intriguing sort of late round undrafted free agent kind of guy that you'd look to develop. But beyond Rattler, to me, kind of it's not an amazing class in terms of that back end of the draft. My my first question to you, Simon, deals with the 21st overall pick. I think my ideal scenario would be for the Dolphins to draft a tackle who plays right guard for one year, maybe two, then takes over at left tackle for Teron Armstead. So who among those prospects would fit that description and might be available at 21? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I, I, think, I think you're probably right. Uh, there are some names that I'd also like to see us draft that my, my one point about this whole situation with the Dolphins is they put themselves in a really good position with free agency with a number of sort of under the radar free agent signings. I think they've improved their depth generally. And you look at a team like Baltimore, when the starters go down, they're able to 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 fill the roster and to fill the field with players who the, where the drop off isn't that big. And I think the Dolphins have done a good job with that this year. At what position? What, well, I think the interior of the defensive line, I think you add Jordan Brooks is a good player. You add Kendall Fuller. You add Jordan Poyer. I think there's players that there are depth players on the offensive line in terms of improving that. You know, it, Jack Driscoll is better than Lester Cotton, for example. Now, I'm not saying that you build a wall with Jack Driscoll, but I'm saying that if a starter goes down, you are putting a brick in that is higher up the wall than than Lester Cotton, with no disrespect to, to Lester. Um, okay. So I, I think there are there are certainly improvements that have been made. I think that uh, I think the tight end Johnny Smith is a good improvement in terms of having somebody that can work perfectly in that system. And you go back to to three or four years ago when Ryan Tannehill was at Tennessee and winning Comeback Player of the Year under Arthur Smith. Johnny Smith was had two back to back fantastic seasons, and, and this offense perfectly fits what what he wants to do. In terms of the offensive line of the question, I, I don't think Miami can. Have, and this is the thing that has bugged me for the entire draft period Miami's window to win is open and it's open you know now they cannot afford a third straight year of a mulligan they can't afford a Cam Smith who sits on the sideline for the whole year they can't afford a Channing Tindall who only plays on special teams they have to come away really and truly with first and second round starters or extremely heavy contributors so drafting a left tackle or a tackle has to be somebody like you say Alan who plays 
guard and can start a guard or even center when you look at someone like Graham Barton from day one they cannot draft a guy and I know that Chris Greer will be absolutely fascinated with and by Amarius Mims of Georgia because he's an unbelievable talent he looks like he was built in a laboratory and has you know the upside of a, a future all pro and that that doesn't just come from me that comes from scouts that comes from Jim Nagy that comes from all sorts of people who've said the same thing now he started eight games in his career and all at right tackle yeah. he is six foot eight he is not going to be a guard that clogs up a path you, you just can't play a six foot eight inch guy a, a, a guard because he's a quarterback Exactly, exactly. So that's where the rubber might meet the road for the Dolphins because you see a guy like Mims who could be a 10, 12-year perennial all-pro who can take over from Toronto Armstead, but you also have this window that's starting to get a little bit closed because the quarterback also needs a contract. And and if you can't play him, what's the point? So so to me, you are looking at... And the you know one of the names that the, uh, of guys that keeps coming up which Barry was at the Oklahoma Pro Day. He's now coming in on a 30 visit. Tyler Guyton, who's the kid from from um, from Oklahoma, right tackle, uh, was speaking to Jim Nagy after the Senior Bowl. And he said that, you know, this is a guy that scouts have said remind him of uh, of Tyron Smith, you know, and that is, that is high praise indeed. You know, he might have the most upside of anyone in the tackle class, anyone in the draft, but he is inexperienced. He's undisciplined with his technique. He lacks a bit of play strength. But the traits are, he's absolutely dripping with traits. But he's six foot seven. Again, are you going to play a six foot seven kid who's only been a right tackle, albeit with left tackle skills, at guard? And I think it's unlikely. So the names that that, that really stand out to me in terms of a guy that can that the Dolphins can plug and play as a guard starter are uh, Troy Fatanu of Washington, who's a left tackle at Washington. He's 6'3, he's 317 pounds. He's a day one starter at left guard with a future going to left tackle. But I don't think he'll be there. I think he goes in the late probably the early teens to mid teens. I don't think he gets past Seattle. I don't think he gets past Pittsburgh if he's still there because he's just a really good player. He's an extremely high floor prospect. He is agile. He's got the best feet of any tackle in the class. And I include Mims in that. He is the best. He has the best footwork of anybody. And he's a day one starter, like I said, at left guard. Then you have Talese Fuaga of Oregon State. Now he's 6'5". He's almost 6'6". He's very quick. He's a two-year starter at right tackle. Is he a left tackle? Is he a guard? He's got short arms. He's got you know, really great size. He's well balanced in pass protection. He is dominant, and I mean dominant in the run game. To be in, you know, he is a guy that throws dudes out of the club in terms of you know you get in his way and he's going to mow you down and he's going to do it with great technique. So um, can he be a can he be a guard though? Does that's he have... the question. I think he I think he can be a guard. And the other name and the name that Drew Rosenhaus doesn't believe is getting out of the top ten, but I don't believe him is J C Latham of, of Alabama, who's the highly shocker, recruited. Yeah. yeah, shocker. He would say that about his client. Yeah, unbelievable, huh? But he is a, you know, he is a massive specimen at right tackle, a huge power base, huge bubble backside. But isn't know, he like 340 plus? He's 342. He's 342, but he's got great movement. You know, he's got great movement. And you have to have great movement to play in that complex Alabama offense. You know, you look at those running backs, you know, not all of them are Derek Henry and Mark Ingram. You know, Jason McClellan coming out now is a wide zone running back who started for Alabama. You know, they have, uh, you know, a good mix of, of schemes up front. And he is a... You know, as a run blocker, he has outstanding strength. He gets movement at contact. And don't forget, the Dolphins aren't just a finesse outside zone team. Yes, they, they run are. a lot of inside. <laughs> they run a lot of inside. <laughs> yeah, but they also run a lot of inside zone. They run a lot of power. You know, they run far more inside than I think all of us thought that they would run early on. Um, the other name then, obviously, is Graham Barton, the guy at Duke, who's a left tackle. Um, you know, people worry about his size, but then you put on the tape, and are we really sure he can't play left tackle in the NFL? You know, you throw him on against Jared Verse of Florida State, who to me is a top 12, top 14 pick in this draft, and, you know, he plays him about as well as anybody played him all year. The other guy, Jackson Powers Johnson, the center of Oregon. You know, he could also play guard. He started at guard. He started one year at center. He won the Remington Award. Turned up at the Senior Bowl. Was absolutely outstanding. Talking guys left, right, and center. Feels like there's been a bit of a kind of a, you know, what it's like in draft season, the buzz sort of it feels like a bit of an anti JPJ buzz. But again, he's a guy that's coming into Miami on a 30 visit and somebody they're clearly interested in who could be a starter at center if uh, if um, the new guy doesn't work out. Aaron Why do you Brewer think and falling. Why do you think the perception? I don't is know. I, so I dug in quite quite deeply into why he might be falling, and and the only real thing that I could find was so he had an injury. Um, 
a neck injury let me just check when he was in high school and i just wonder whether or not at the combine um if he got a red flag whether or not that got a, a red flag so just just finding it here so um yeah uh, th- th- so he, I mean, 2017 in high school he was stretched off the field he had a helmet helmet clash that left him with a serious concussion but the neck injury that then left tingling in that area and he had i just wonder whether or not at the combine something turned up in terms of that that neck injury that's just kind of made him drop a little bit nothing i've not heard anything about it and if if the the powers johnson family are listening and i've got that wrong then that's the only reason i could put it i know they're big dolphins fans anyway so um but that would be the only reason that you know he is an experience but he's also a very good player and teams made the same mistake with creed humphrey three years ago and now he's an all pro and a two-time super bowl champion and he's of that ilk of player so any any day three linemen that intrigue you because if the dolphins whiff on it in the first and second round and there's a very good possibility that they could because i think those six tackles by the time you get to 21 more than likely you're going to be left with the austin jackson of the pick no offense to austin jackson um and you know and you might and then the second round you probably, if you know Chris Curry, is probably either going to trade down or take the value pick. That doesn't yeah. necessarily guarantee this is going to be an offensive lineman. Any day three guys that you think can not be maybe an immediate starter, but can displace a Lester Cotton or a Robert Jones? Yeah, I mean, there's a kid at Yale that I really like. He's called Kieran Amagaji, and obviously Mike McDaniel will like a Yale kid. I actually think he'll, I think he'll probably go on day two. Uh, he was a tackle at Yale. He is a raw but really, really fascinating prospect. He's the best FCS prospect probably in the draft. He tore his quad and missed most of 2023, but this was a kid that was going to go to the Senior Bowl. This was a kid who's got the seventh largest wingspan since 1999. Obviously, the jump from the Ivy League to the NFL is a big one, um, but his tape is excellent, albeit at the the lower level. He's a guy that I think is interesting. Blake Fisher at Notre Dame, He's a right tackle. He beat Joel out to win the starting job at at left tackle and then got injured as a freshman and got moved to right tackle, all stayed at left tackle, and the rest is is history. Every time I watch Joel, I look at Blake Fisher and think, God, you are a really, really good player. This is a kid that was a five-star recruit. He is a, you know, he knows how to win the leverage battle. And I think you could play him inside, outside. I think they'll like Jordan Morgan, the kid from Arizona who can play guard. He's got some injury concerns, plays left tackle. He's got short arms, less than 33 inches, and that will probably cloud his final position. But you look at him on tape and he holds up against the the better rushers in, in the Pac-12. And I class Leatu Latu in that uh, as one of my absolute favorite players in this entire in this entire draft. Patrick Paul, a kid at Houston. I know that the Dolphins were all over him at the Senior Bowl. They were interviewed him again at the combine. I saw an interview with him in one of the Houston papers where he said the Dolphins are the team that he's heard most from. Uh, he's, you know, 3,000, 2,950 snaps at left tackle. He is, again, he's a tackle, not a guard, but he's six foot seven. He's 330 pounds. He looks like he's built in a lab, 36 inch arms, but you're going to have to break down his technique completely. So, but this sort of strikes me as the kind of the Chris Greer, Noig, Benogane, Austin Jackson kind of baby that he can build up into something potentially special but in terms of guys i think will would go on day two and day three that are guards that that aren't even going to be converts that are just guards you've got christian haynes at uconn who i think is a really good player 49 straight games is stud right guard in a zone scheme so perfect for us he's quick he's aggressive he moves people in the run game as well as anybody in the class he's a really good player Steve Ross will probably be talking about Zach Zinter, who's kind of been forgotten a little bit, the kid from Michigan. He had a double leg break in November, but you know he ticks an awful lot of boxes for teams looking for a mean and nasty guard who can start absolutely day one. 42 career starts, 41 at right guard. He would start week one if he's healthy. He's just got great football intelligence. You know He's, a, he's another really good player. Uh, and then there's a kid at Kansas who I really like called Dominic Puny, who had no FBS or FCS offers out of high school. So he essentially played four years in the Mid-American Intercollegiate Athletic Association for, for Central Missouri, a Division II, transferred to Kansas, played a year at left tackle, played a year at left guard. Uh, he is a very interesting player. He is fast and precise and heavy-handed. He is a lock for day two. He's a very, very good player. Um, and it's guys like that, I think, that, you know, certainly on day two. And then when you get into day three, Illinois have got a kid called Isaiah Adams, who was a JUCO kid. He's, played, he's got five position versatility, played right guard as a junior, right tackle as a senior. I liked him a lot when I watched his tape. JUCO uh, in kid. this age of college athletics? 
Sorry, say that again. As a JUCO in this age of college athletics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So he played. Um, he he's Canadian actually. So he began his career in a, a place called Wilfrid Laurier University, Ontario. Then transferred oh, really? transferred to Garden City Community College, and then joined the Illini after that. So, so yeah, he's um he's a good player. Um, and then there's a kid, another kid that intrigues me is a kid called Bucky Williams of Appalachian State. And I don't know if you've watched Game of Thrones, but he would not look out of place as a as an extra on Game of Thrones. He has got a long. I'm mean, looking up. His photos are unbelievable. He's got a long ginger beard, a long ginger hair. But actually, he's a right guard. He is tough and nasty and physical and smart and plays a brand of football that will have guys like Butch Barry banging the table for a shot at him. This is a guy that was a five-year starter, played a little bit of Austin Pay, and then went to Appalachian State, 4,000 snaps under his belt. He, he's a he's an interesting player. His dad played at Georgia Southern. His granddad played at Middle Tennessee State. His brother plays on the offensive line at Chattanooga. And um, he sell the Appalachian State fans, he's so good and pancakes so many people. They sell T-shirts on game day that say, you got bucked. On the front of them, so um, you can kind of tell what kind of guy he is. I'm sure he's not like, he's not like the mountain, is he? Simon, he's, he's not like the mountain, is he? He's kind of that. He's, he'd probably be one of the mountains' kind of friends, you know. He'd certainly be in that gang, yeah, behind the wall a little bit with this kind of flowing mane, and yeah. I'm sure Kendall Lamb would love to take him under the wing. They have a yeah, he absolutely a brotherhood would. there. Um, Poop, you want to you want to ask the next question? I, I do, and I'm going to shift away from the offensive line. I, I know, Omar, you, you, you talk offensive line for five five hours straight, but I want to – Yeah, Simon, I appreciate that. I, I If I had a cigar, <laughs> no, I would smoke it right now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one guy to mention, actually, the one guy that I really – that we talked about, Powers Johnson, you guys will know him, obviously. And if, to me, flying under the radar, but every time I watched him this offseason and I ended up going back and thinking, he can't be this good, Kelly. It's Matthew Lee, Matt Lee the, from Miami. Um he is like absolutely uh, a Miami Dolphin tie. He came in on the to the to the local pro day. He is a wide zone, get up on the shoulder, outside shoulder of the DT, roll his hips through contact. You know, looks great in space. Uh, leadership, high FBI, great work ethic. Like I just kept going back and back and watching more and more Miami tape and thought to myself, "Wow, this is this is a kid who's got real talent." and you saw him against, you know, you want to see the best against the best. You want to see Marvin Harrison against the, you know, the best receivers. And you want to see Barton against Verse and, and Fuaga against Latu. And when he played Tyler Davis of Clemson and uh, and the, the Clemson DT, whose name I have terrible trouble pronouncing. Aurora. Uh, yeah, Ruke Aurora. He was excellent. Uh, he was excellent. And you look at him and say, you know, if he's 315, 318 pounds, he's an absolute lock second day pick to me so um matt lee is a very intriguing guy Locked I think second opinion. day pick and what about cohen the, the i think he'd be I, I think if he was bigger weight wise he'd be a locked second day pick i don't think he's he's 301 pounds and he added 13 pounds between the shrine game and the combine which kind of tells you that's you water know, weight water weight exactly exactly yeah. so you know that would be a concern but they just signed a center aaron brewer who's like 200 is the same size as my daughter. He's like 200, 180 pounds or whatever he is. So, you know, um, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. He's an interesting guy, though. So, yeah. Okay, enough the with other. the offensive lineman. Enough with the offensive lineman. I'm going to go edge defender here. Yeah. And because to me, that's an important need, not only, again, 100%. looking at this year, but also because I think Bradley Chubb, based on his contract and his situation, may or may not be here for, for, the, for the long haul. So who you mentioned Jared verse maybe a top 12 14 pick so obviously he'd likely not be there at 21 who realistically could be there at 21 So I have three players who are top of the edge board and I have them in a slightly different order I think to to some my number one edge player is Laotu Latu of UCLA who reminds me so much of of, of Jalen Phillips played at Washington he also has the kind of the alarming medical history. So he had a serious neck injury and was forced to medically retire by Washington, sat out two years. Um, and then his mom essentially just was spent time on the internet trying to find doctors, found one of the world's most renowned neck surgeons. He went to see him, signed him off, said he could play, went back to UCLA and has just been the, the numbers on him over the last two years where he's been completely healthy. I mean, he's had 127 pressures over the last two seasons alone. He has... And I'm not just saying this uh, because I know we're all prisoners at the moment, but he has the most refined pass rush arsenal I've seen in many, many years. For, for Kids coming out of college are not this refined in terms of their technique and, and how how many counters they have, how many ways that they can win to get to the quarterback. Most guys he, have two moves, maybe. 
yeah, I mean, he has a stab, a club, a ghost, a cross chop, a euro step, a spin, a double right. swipe, all sorts of, you know, the, you look at his past win rate percentage against true pass sets and only the Bowser brothers come close to his numbers in terms of his ability to get to the quarterback. He is an instinctive pass rusher who, you know, go back 10, 15 years and you look at when Alden Smith came into the league and had, 17 18 sacks in his rookie season against San for, for San Francisco. He has that type of I don't think he's necessarily a, a three down every down starter right away because he probably needs a bit more sand in his pants as a, as a run defender, but as a pass rusher, he is a phenomenal player. Then you have Verse, who's probably the most all rounded guy. And what I love about Jared Verse obviously went to Albany, backed himself to come to Florida State, had back to back years, could have left last year and been a top 10 pick, stayed added to his arsenal, just got better, and that's what he cares about. He is obsessed, and I've dug into quite a lot of his background, talked to some people. He is obsessed with getting better, and you can see that. You go back to look at his Albany tape. You go back to his first year at Florida State. You just look at how he wins the leverage battle, how he can convert speed to power. He is a disruptive force on stunts and slants and twists. As a run defender, he, he is heavy in the bottom half. He can set the edge. He wins with force and with twitch. I, I think he's a really good player and he cares about being he cares about being an all pro. He wants to be the absolute best. And then Dallas Turner, who most people would have first, and I think he's a very good player. It's nothing about him at all. Uh, I think there are some issues that I saw with him on tape. He has his hand usage is mediocre at best. Like he, you know. Let, let's not be silly. He has unbelievable get off. You know, he can get up on the the outside shoulder of a of a of a tackle before he's even moved. You know, he but his hand use is, is mediocre. I think when tackles get into him and they jump him, it takes him out because he doesn't know how to use his hands. He has trouble disengaging, and even the things that he does wonderfully are still a little bit raw. And I don't think you know this is not Will Anderson in terms of his ability. This is a guy I think is only going to be a sub package pass rusher. But I think these three separate themselves from the field. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised if Verse and Latu. Now it depends what the medicals say with Latu because you know some teams will have him off the board because of the fact that you know he has had the the neck problems. Verse. I thought it was um, insightful yesterday that that Peter Schrager had Jared Verse as, as the Dolphins' first round pick in his mock draft. When you consider that Mike McDaniel and Peter Schrager are very very close, you know they are very good friends. Um, yeah. I, I thought that was instructive in terms of potentially how the Dolphins are thinking. And Latu himself has said that the one team that has spent more time with him in this entire process, who was at the pro day, who uh, who has been with him, has been speaking to him, it, are the Miami Dolphins. And that does not surprise me because this is a guy I think comes in day one and ends up with 12, 15 sacks as a rookie. He is that good. So yeah, to me, yeah, it's so Latu and Versa are not going to be there when the Dolphins pick. Well, I don't know though because, you know, if what if teams say that that they they're just not happy with the with the Jared with the Latu's um, medicals, you know that could happen. And yeah, and right. look, Verse has Verse has all round potential, but he is not necessarily a guy that's going to get you fifteen. C. you know, he's not going to lead the NFL in sacks. He might get you ten sacks. He might get you eight sacks. You know that. Uh, uh, and are you going to bet that you want a guy who can? You know, would you take a Dallas Turner and a Latu who you know are probably going to get more sacks? And then does a verse fall because by the very nature of the fact that there's eight tackles who could go in the first round and there's a whole group of wide receivers and you start a run on tackles and suddenly a verse starts to slip through the through the net or a Brock Bowers starts to slip through the net because Bowers has had one of the most uniquely weird draft seasons of any prospect I can think of in the last 15 years in terms of, you know, he has not done a single thing. He has not performed. He ran 15 pretty lackadaisical routes at the Georgia Pro Day. He's not measured. He's not weighed. He's not run. He's not jumped. He's not done anything. Um, so, you know, one or two of those players could start to fall and all of a sudden you find yourself in a, in a position. And look, the other thing is that we all know is that Chris Greer, for, for whatever you think of the job that Chris Greer has done, he has put himself in a position where if there's a player that they like that is starting to fall, they have three third-round picks next year, one of their own and two compensatory picks. They could easily deal one of those third-round picks or their third-round pick next year, knowing they've still got two more comp compensatory picks for, for Christian Wilkins and for... Um, well, or, uh, yeah, exactly that they could deal away a third round pick to jump up three, four, five spots if somebody they really like starts to fall. If a Laotu Latu gets to 16, but they kind of have a sense that somebody might be taking them at 18, or if there's a Brock Bowers drops to 16 and they think the Bengals might take him at 18, I think that they've pulled the trigger on those on those compensatory picks, knowing that if the right guy is there, they'll they'll get rid of one of 
you know their own pick next year to to move up and secure a guy they really like because they put themselves in a in a best player available situation with the caveat that if somebody really sexy is there then let's pull the trigger so I, I don't disagree with you in turn. I hear where you're coming from in terms of them addressing all of their draft needs, but then look at the wide receiver position yep. and I get it. John o. Smith can be in there and he can be a flex weapon and you can use him like you use Mike Kosicki and he could probably block for you, which Mike Kosicki couldn't. Um, however, you know, I wasn't a Mike Kosicki fan. No, everybody in the world knows that. Um, two one dimensional tells you exactly what you're doing on a pass play. You, Mike Kosicki's in the game, you know, you're passing. Do you know um, how many broken tackles Mike Gesicki had as a Miami Dolphin? Three in four years. Am I close? Yeah. No, he had less than 10. Yeah, I think it was seven. <laughs> seven <laughs> broken tackles in four years. He probably years. has that, that many leapovers in yeah. terms of uh, players he tried to jump over. I'd um, rather break a tackle, but yeah. So here's my point on wide receiver. And just follow me. Just hear me out here, Simon. We all know there's an unhealthy obsession with speed with Mike McDaniel. Mm. He doesn't even deny it. Okay. Um, we all know the situation contractually with Tyreek and Jalen Waddle, where if we're thinking about this two year window, they can become rather expensive. Yep. And we know how complicated this offense is to learn and grow and grasp. Do you think that there's a chance that one of these ultra talented wide receivers can fall there and the Dolphins can be tempted to take a wide receiver at 21. I absolutely think they can be tempted to take a wide receiver at 21. I, I don't think any of the big three will fall unless teams are really, really, really worried about the off-field stuff with Malik Neighbors, who was arrested and uh, I think has is, has been a bit of a diva. I think he's probably the word that is used most of all rather than a, a bad person. There's no way, and obviously Malik, um, Harrison, there's no way Roma Dunze, who's probably my favorite player in the entire draft, get get out of the top seven or eight um you too but, so many oh, guys like rome like 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 the washington kid who do that oh, i love him he's the phenomenal player he has app he has everything he has absolutely everything he is a just a and he's clean as a whistle off the field and an absolutely stunning player on it i just the, the you know size athleticism speed separation multiple release packages explosion run after the catch ability yeah. toughness he can block and he catches absolutely he's dk metcalf without the muscles he is a i i love it he's 6'2 212 runs a 4-4 i mean he's a you know he was a state champion in the 200 meters he is run a 10 60 700 meters he was gateway player of the year in nevada he is a you know this isn't an accident that he's this good so um, to me, Brian Thomas is an interesting name. Now, does he get past Cincinnati in terms of them picking at 18 a, a year's worth of um, you think he's a first rounder? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's 6'2, 209, runs a 4'3. Uh, he is quick, he is sudden, he is explosive. And like I said earlier about um, about JJ McCarthy, Brian Thomas was the second name where I was told that he was an absolutely unbelievable on the boards in terms of his football intelligence uh, at the combine um and how teams were just blown away by his his football knowledge um he's a very sudden player and he you know just one year of major production but and i hate doing comps but people like comps so you get a bit of a feel of a mike evans type about him in terms of the size and the skill set and what mike could do coming out of texas a&m um the, six though yeah, really Mike's six four, but you know he's. Well, I mean, Thomas is six two seven, so that's you know six three essentially. So it's, it's not far off. Full inch smaller. Oh my god! Sorry, it's yeah. like an inch and a half. Okay, it's an, yeah. inch, and an inch and an eight. Come on, I mean, Come on now. and then you throw in. So you throw in, and people talk about the Washington kids. That Jalen Polk to me is the one of the big super sleepers in the entire draft. This is Brandon Ayuk two point Now we know, and uh, you know the Dolphins would have taken Brandon Ayuk in the first round had the 49ers not traded up to to, to take him in that draft and they ended up taking Noah Rigbenogane. I know that as absolute fact um, from within the Dolphins uh, organization. And I was told that on draft night when that happened. So that is in revisionist history in terms of what Ayuk's gone on to do. Um, Polk is that kind of player in terms of you look at somebody who is a blue collar, down and dirty guy who likes to block in the run game, who Ooh. is really crafty in his route running, is unafraid of work in the middle. He's an absolute leader. Oh, and he's six foot two, 203 pounds, runs a 4'4. Four four. This is a kid that I, I think is going to go significantly higher than people. Than people First think. round? 
I've seen him, I've started to see him entering the bottom end of first round mocks for people. And I think, look, a lot of the NFL schematic, Omar, it's, you know, not player one doesn't always fit team one, but player two fits team one perfectly. And and maybe that, you know, you go back and look at Logan Mankins a few years ago. Logan Mankins wasn't a first round pick on anybody's draft board and the Patriots took him because he fit perfectly what what he did and what they do and Logan Mankins ended up as a multiple year all pro and you know he's in the conversation to be a to be a hall of famer when he when his time comes and you know th- there's a reason for that he just fitted exactly perfectly what they want and the one name I think that we you know we have to talk about and you, you know the, the only time that I've we've seen McDaniel on the road this year in terms of going <laughs> it, it was Texas and with Xavier Worthy and you know for obvious reason that McDaniel loves speed. You know, he loves those players who are fast and Xavier Worthy is the fastest player in, in combine history. Now he is, is he six foot. Receiver? Uh, sorry. Is he a complete receiver? See, there we go. The, 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 so the question I would throw back to you is, uh, do, are they after a complete receiver? Because what I would be. say, well, yeah, of course, but are they after an immediate complete receiver or are they okay with having a contributor who can play as a number three or as a number four but has unbelievable twitch speed suddenness knowing that they have complete receivers pretty much at, as their one and their number two in that if you put an Xavier Worthy on the field with Johnny Smith with Devon Achan with Tyreek Hill and with Jalen Waddle yeah I don't know what you're covering doing. Uh, Time out for a second. I'm going to jump in here because I made a face and I want to explain my face. As good as they are and as explosive as they are, I do not consider Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle to be "quote unquote" complete receivers. No, okay, but how many? Okay, so how many complete receivers are there in the league then? Uh, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Yeah, uh, Uh, Jamar Chase. Sorry, is Jamar Chase a complete receiver? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know. Some of the injury things worry me about Jamar. What what can he not do? What can he not do? No, that's that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I That's mean, fair. and and we we say that to, yeah, Tariq can't do everything. Okay. Um, no, but I would so, so I would on the flip side of that, I would make an argument that in my lifetime as following the NFL, which is borderline forty years, I would say that Jerry Rice is era one, Randy Moss is era two, and Tyreek is era three in terms of the receivers that are almost unplayable in terms of what the in ter- you just can't. They are so dominant in terms of what they do. You cannot. You can find answers for Justin Jefferson, right? You cannot find complete answers for somebody who runs the way that Tyreek does. So for Xavier Worthy, the thing that I think is interesting about Worthy is that he is an elite ball tracker. He runs away from absolutely anybody. But the thing that I think is really interesting, and I think the thing that Mike McDaniel will find interesting and really will care about is that he does so much unrewarded, dirty work in that, in that Texas offense. Okay. He will absolutely he ran 93 vertical routes last season, okay, in 2022. And that is significantly more than anybody else in the country because what he does is clean out. Is, yeah, but he clears out. He cleared out holes for that running game. He cleared it out for B. John Robinson and he cleared it out for Jonathan Brooks last year before he got injured. In terms of this is a guy where you just say, you know, you've got you're rolling a safety over the top, you've got your number one corner covering you, and there's a safety over the top. You just take them down the field because what we can do then in the screen game in behind, in the run game in behind, is make use of that space that you've vacated with your incredible speed. And he, you watch the film and he does it over and over and over again. And it is absolutely selfless. And I think for a team that wants to continue to establish the run game, especially outside zone, if you can have a guy like Worthy and you can just clear out that side of the field, or you line the three of them up, Worthy, Waddle, Hill. You're and kind of running. telling me. Which is, yeah, I it's kind of what Terry really does. Think. Kind of yeah. what Tyreek does right yeah. now. You need to- the play yeah, strength I mean, is They have Waddle uh-huh. and Tyreek to run clear out routes. Yeah, uh, it's. But you can do it on both sides now, which you know, which would make you, you know, you could you could easily pair Achan and and Worthy on one side, Waddle and Hill on the other, and you're running back. Where where are you running to? Because for a defense, that all you're doing is stressing the defense all the time, and that's that that's such an important thing that should never be overlooked in terms of what you're trying to do is you're trying to set up a defense, set up a defense, stress them, stress them, stress them until they just break. And Worthy is a defense breaker. And and I wasn't convinced, and the size does worry me, and the plaque of play strength does worry me. He's 169 pounds, or he's played at about 173 last year. That That's worrying. But 
the things that he can offer specifically to a Mike McDaniel offense are not the same as the things that he could offer to a Luke Getzey offense or to a Matt, you know, whoever, uh, uh, Doug Peterson offense or whatever. He is going to be a specific fit for a specific team. And that would be a Sean McVay team. That would be a Matt LaFleur team. And that would be a Mike McDaniel team in terms of the things that he could do. So, I, I think the Dolphins will be interested. And like I said, you go and look at the face that McDaniel pulled when he saw him and you thought, that's a guy that's absolutely in love. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah he, he fell in the mess of love. The last thing I have from me, from my vantage point, is I'm going to tell you my two my two draft crushes, and I just want to get your reaction. If you can believe yeah. I'm, I'm weird. Well, you, you'll probably already think I'm weird, but if I'm weird for liking those guys, one of them I don't think is, is exactly going on a major limb is Mike Sandra still from Michigan. Love him. The other one is Mikai Wingo from LSU. Okay, yeah, interesting. So Sam Rastrill, obviously, uh, and I hate to correct you, but it's actually Mikey Sam Rastrill, which oh, I only sorry. worked out the other no, it's all right. Yeah. Um, I, I love him. I mean, he's to me, he's the best nickel, really, in the draft. He was a three-year receiver. Uh, he is just a guy that – I love the mantra, just draft good football players, uh, and that's what he is. He's, a, he's just one of the best, most competitive, most athletic nickelbacks in college over the last two seasons. He's going to go in round two. He'll absolutely go in round two. Um, you look at the numbers as well in terms of, you know, and we, you know, we kind of tend to fall in love with combine numbers and things. But his short shuttle was four zero one. He had a forty inch vertical, thirteen hundred snaps on defense out of the nickel over the last two seasons. Won a national championship. He's a three time state champion back to back to back in in high school. The kid just knows how to win, and he is probably of the of all the prospects in the draft book. He probably him and maybe two or three others are the ones where people just say he is a guy that you build a culture around in terms of what they call him the ceo at michigan that's what he is he is the guy that everybody trusts everybody loves he's a great player i love him. you know you know what the vibe yeah the vibe i got from him simon i i got a honey badger vibe from him yeah yeah absolutely that's a very that's a very good and then wingo it, 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 you talk about you know Defensive linemen, and there are. I, I think there are some interesting defensive linemen in this in this class, of which Wingo is absolutely is absolutely one of them. And uh, you know, we may talk about some of them because the you know the Dolphins probably need a you know they need a guy whether that's a Braden Fisk or a Jazan Newton or a Byron Murphy or or one of those guys. For me, Mingo, absolute kind of bowling ball of human being, just the, the energizer bunny who just plays snap to whistle to the very last you know, whistle of the whistle in terms of what he does. You can play him inside, you play him outside. He's just quick, quick movement, quick feet, quick hands, quick closing speed. Everything is fast. He is a dry disruptor in terms of, you know, once he gets going, once he gets momentum in his pass rush, he is a bit of a tweener. He's six foot, 284 pounds. But um, yeah, I mean, he is, uh, you know, he can get eliminated, I think, by savvy blockers, but he's so fast. And when he times it off, he is a very, very tough ass to block. And the thing that I like that he does that that smaller guys sometimes don't do is he knows how to convert speed to power, and he does that really, really well. So even though he's 284, 286, he can uh, he can do that really well. What, what am I that, that, Omar, Omar, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. But last point I want to make just related to, to Wingo and the other two LSU defensive linemen in the draft, let's not forget – that the Dolphins' new assistant defensive line coach worked yeah. with the LSU defense last year, and his name Absolutely. is at the moment. But uh, that's what. Sorry, go ahead, Omar. Uh, yeah, I want to get dig deep a little bit deeper into the defensive line. That that's yeah. probably the position that I have got the best understanding of in terms of film work. I, I'll be honest; I have not done that much film work this year because life is lifing, um, and I don't have four a.m. hours to go look at college tape, but. A lot of these guys, I have found them a little bit light in the tuchus, Um, in terms of their ability to anchor and play the point and hold the line. Um, I don't really see any zero technique guys here. Um, and I think that most people really project this to be a very mm, light defensive tackle draft. Um, do you agree, disagree? And, and who do you think fits what Miami is doing or what Anthony Reaver wants to do? So to take that last question first, I mean, what Anthony seems to do is have that mixture really of the the really heavy sort of sand in the pants, zero techniques that he's had consistently at Baltimore. And I suppose in this draft, you're looking at a McKinley Jackson, a kid, the kid from Texas A&M who's 6'1", 331 pounds, a kind of Bill Parcells used to call them kind of planet theory guys, just the just not that many guys on the planet who look like that you know he's a zero technique and a nose tackle 
what I would say, yeah. a, another guy that, so the Dolphins have brought him in on a 30 visit as well as the, the kid from FAU, um, Evan Anderson, um, who was 370 pounds when he arrived at F FAU, 365 as a sophomore. He's down to 319, but he's got the frame to to build back up and is a zero technique. And then the the most intriguing guy out of the zeros is Tavondre Sweat, the, the Outland Trophy winner who was arrested last week. Um you know, in the sort of the what what one GM a couple of years ago called the stupidity window, in that you know the the pre-draft post combine the post combine pre-draft period is it, he referred to as the stupidity window, um, and who will plunge through the stupidity window and damage their future uh, and their bottom line. And this year it was sweat. You know, you're looking for guys who who stay clear of any you know problems in that sort of post combine pre-draft uh, time. But he's 366 pounds. He is a massive human being. He has massive potential. He has big time talent in that body. He can soak up double teams. He can absolutely drop anchor and, and just sink his hips and soak up. But he, he also has some, I think he has some pretty, um, pretty Dexter Lawrence type pass rush juice that he flashed in 2023 and some untapped pass rush potential. Um, in terms of being a you know a more unique zero, what I think that you know most of the guys in this class are in the sort of the three hundred low two nine the high two nineties low three hundreds, because that's just the way that the modern game is is moving. You're not looking for you know you look at the numbers that Justin Madubuike put up for Baltimore last year. You look at the numbers that Christian Wilkins had. You look at the numbers Zach Sealer had in terms of sacks. You look at Aaron Donald's sack totals. I know Aaron Donald is an insanely special player, but you know the value in defensive tackles is not now just the value of guys that can stop the run. It's the it's the guys that can pressure inside. If you can get internal pressure as well as being able to get pressure around the perimeter, it just frees you up in terms of your linebackers to you don't have to send linebackers on blitzes because you know that you know you're going to get home on the inside in terms of sub package pass rushers. You don't have to stick a you don't have to stick a 240 pound edge rusher in the middle like we used to do with Jason Taylor in those old Tiger packages that we used to run back in the early 2000s. Now what we do is you you, you can put in a 285 pounder, you can put in a Darius Robinson of Missouri or a you know a Byron Murphy or a, of Texas guys like that who can get to the quarterback because they've got insane speed. They all used to be high school wide wannabe wide receivers and running backs and, and those sorts of things. They've just put on the weight and they can get to the and that that's the way that the game is going. That's the way that the modern game is that the internal pressure A and B gap pressures from from defensive tackles on on obvious passing downs. It is key to winning the game in the NFL these days. So that's why I think you're seeing more and more guys who are lighter in the in the bottom half than we would have. You know, there aren't that many Gilbert Browns and Sam Adams and Chester McLaughlin's and you know Albert Hainsworth these these days. But there are great guys. name, great name, Chester McLaughlin. That's a Chester great McLaughlin. name. Yes, love it, Simon. But, you know, there are the kind of the you know guys who 20 you know when i was growing up in the 80s watching you know william perry playing dt for the bears that you know that those were the guys you know tim bowens and you know you go back and to, to the old dolphins days that there aren't that many tim bowens these days what there are now is that you know and i think that's why for for, for all, fa all all the dolphins fans who were really disappointed about christian wilkins i think christian wilkins bet on himself and i absolutely applaud him for doing that you know i i think the dolphins wanted to pay christian wilkins in, in the kenny clark kind of um field a year ago which was that kind of 75 million ish for a guy that didn't really you know as well as he played as active as he played as good as he was against the run he didn't really affect the pass in game that much and then he delivered 10 sacks and he put himself rightly in the chris jonesy kind of financial and, and that's what you have to do and i think you know he backed himself and the dolphins decided a year ago that they'd kind of give it and see because they probably didn't think he was going to get into the range that he did and, and he did and he was successful and he got the money from the raiders and that's you know to be applauded but those are the guys that make the money on the interior of the defensive line. That's why Justin Madawike is, you know, is an all pro because he had 12, 13 sacks and he's light, but he is phenomenal, phenomenal fast hands, phenomenal fast feet. And if Anthony Weaver was his defensive, you know, line coach as he was last year, Miami have brought in a lot of big human beings to to soak up as, as you know, two gappers and and potential nose guards and, and nose tackles. Then maybe they're going to look for a for a Madabuike, like a Jazan Newton or a Byron Murphy in that in that twenty one area, who's somebody who can get to the quarterback, but also you know you can line them up outside and they can reduce inside. You can mix and match pass rushes, you can mix and match techniques, you can mix and match fronts and 
that's what the game's all about. It's it's trying to create difficulty for the for the Mike McDaniel's and the Sean McVeighs and those kind of you know the Matt Lafleur's and the guys who are leading the field in terms of offensive minds and and creative offensive scheming. So Newton and Murphy are your only two that you would think would be there at twenty one. Or, or yeah, I think Newton uh, Murphy might go before Murphy's my number one tackle. I think he's he's just so young. He's only just twenty one. Um, you know, and you look at he was borderline unblockable down the stretch for for Texas. His interior quickness to get off blocks and to create havoc in the backfield. He out leverages everybody. He's just a he, he's a game changing. He's a game changing player. He led all defensive linemen in FBS football with his pass rush win percentage last year. He, you know, he's. 297 pounds, but he knows how to get to the quarterback. He's to me, he's, a, he's an absolutely explosive pass rushing three technique in a 43 front, but you can do all sorts of things with him in odd fronts as well. And he's a rock solid top 20 guy with a with a high ceiling. And Newton, you know, again, undersized, shorter than ideal arms, but he's so quick. His hands are so quick. He's just a pocket nuisance. He's a pain in the ass for people in terms of. You know, he's a disruptor, mayhem inside with this quickness and and tackles for a loss. He, you know, he had in high school, I mean, the numbers, as a senior, he had 16 sacks and 29 and a half tackles for a loss. And this is in high school, you know, this uh, as a defensive tackle. Yeah, um, but he's probably yeah. playing way inferior to him, but yes. No, well, I don't know. I don't know. He's a, uh, he's a good player. He's the sort of guy that you can, uh, and also don't forget, he was recruited to Illinois by the current Dolphins defensive line coach Austin Clark, who was obviously there at Illinois at the time. He was the he was the recruiter that brought him in. So, you know, they've they filled up with big old guys. Um and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see them. And then the other guy is Braden Fisk, the the kid at Florida State, who I mean, he is the, the most twitched up, most rampant full gas, no breaks defensive line in this entire draft. He just creates phenomenal vertical displacement off the snap just to get off on the power is unbelievable one year florida state guy played at western michigan he's had some injuries he's he's 20 he'll be 25 when the season starts so but he's trending Ooh. towards the first round you just watch his tape and he's just like you think he's you trending know, towards the first round yeah i mean that's what that's you know just talking to some people over the last couple of days it feels like he's moving towards that first round you look at some of the people like the peter schragers and the daniel jeremiah's in terms of their mock drafts and their He's a guy that's trending upwards, upwards, upwards all the time. And he's been blowing teams away, apparently, in in meetings and in terms of what he does. And you just look at you look at the numbers. He ran a 437 short shuttle. Okay. Aaron Donald ran a 439 short shuttle. I mean, this is a guy that ran a 478 40 at the combine. He had 168 10 yard split. He was so dominant for, for Florida State down the stretch. You go back and look at the uh, the ACC championship game against Louisville. He was an absolute buzzsaw. He had three sacks in that game. He he controlled that game for Florida State where, without Jordan Travis. He essentially won the game for Florida State in terms of just being able to stop Louisville the whole time because the, the Knowles couldn't move the ball on offense. He's not your kind of classic bull rush threat, although he can do it, but he is just a rip and run gap penetrator who will just cause absolute mayhem in, in the backfield. And if they're looking for a Madabuike, then it's going to be those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. And finally, I want to get your thoughts on the safety spot, because I know a lot of Dolphin fans were like, well, we got Javon Holland, we got Jordan Poyer. And then my answer would be, and that's it. Yeah. Um, you generally take four to five safeties. And I know they got Elijah Campbell, um, but that's an area that they clearly have to add one in the draft. What do you think of this draft class from a safety standpoint? I think it's intriguing to, to, to try and work out what they're actually going to do in terms of how they're going to play. I mean, you look at what the Ravens did on the back end last year, and you know that's kind of the only marker that we've got. But you know they played a lot of zone inside on the back end and man on the outside, and then Mike McDonald was in zone actually seventy three percent of the time in terms of how they played. Now they had the absolute alien that is that is Kyle Hamilton, who was obviously a free safety in Notre Dame, but they were able to play him literally. I mean, he played at slot, he played at nickel, he played at outside corner, he played at linebacker, he played at edge rusher. He had two snaps of defensive tackle. He played free safety, strong safety. I mean, the guy plays all over. Now, do the Dolphins have that guy in, in Javon Holland, or do they have a guy that's similar to him in terms Jalen, of could he Jalen do Ramsey. Some of the... Jalen Ramsey, maybe. Yeah, well, Jalen Ramsey, absolutely. You know, as a guy who who is not, you know, Kyle Hamilton is six foot four, 220 pounds. And before he got injured, I thought he was the best defensive player in the NFL last year. So I'm not trying to say that we're going to replicate that 100%. But what the Dolphins have on the back end is a couple of players in Ramsey and in Holland. Look, you go back into the Javon Holland and he sat out the final year at Oregon because of COVID. For the year and a half before that, he was a slot corner. He did not play free safety for two and a half years before he came into the NFL. He played eight snaps at, at safety um, in his final year of play. He was a dominant slot 
at Oregon, an absolutely dominant slot. And, and you know, I think he could do much more in terms of being moved around the formation if that's what they wanted to do. There are obviously other players, and one of the names that, that comes up if they wanted to go down that route is Cooper DeGene of, of Iowa, a guy that you can play inside, outside. He can be a big nickel. He can be a slot. He can essentially be like... So I thought a couple of years ago, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was one of the best defensive players in the league in terms of what he was able to do, come down into the box, but also to carry number one receivers 40, 50, 60 yards down the field, absolutely hip for hip. Um, and DeGene is not going to be a man-match corner. That's not what he does. There's some stiffness in his hips. But you could move him around that defensive formation like an absolute Swiss Army knife. He is so athletic. You can play him in zone on the inside. You can match him up on running backs out of the backfield. You can play him against tight ends. You could play him at outside corner if you wanted to. You can play him at strong and free safety. He started at linebacker. He started at safety. He started at big nickel. He started at corner for Iowa. He's a phenomenal punt returner. He's a guy that you think he could potentially fill a sort of Kyle Hamilton role. And then the the guy that I think is interesting to me and will obviously be interesting to you guys and, and a lot of the people listening is is Cam Kinchins of Miami. He's not my number one safety in the draft, but I think he's somebody that obviously came into the local pro day the other day. Uh, and what I like about Kinchins is that, and I know he's had a pretty poor off season in terms of the timing. The 40 time was poor. He didn't work out very well at the combine. He didn't work out that much better at the at the Miami Pro Day, but he plays a lot faster than than he looks. His tape absolutely drips with that, that kind of quality and intangibles and ball skills. And to me, he's a high yeah. post free safety, um, but you are left with question marks about, you know, he has average athletic traits, but the, the tape speaks for itself. And sometimes, you know, the combine performance made me go back and look at the tape. And what I saw on the tape was what I saw originally, which is just, uh, he's just a really good player. And, you know, if they decide to do something with Javon Holland and move him down into a sort of a, a nickel-y kind of a Kyle Hamilton-y type role that just makes use of his incredible skill set and, and his talent, you could do a lot worse than a, than a Cam Kinchins. I, 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 there's some interesting players on the back end in terms of safeties, and I, I, it's hard, It's just hard to predict what they're going to do in terms of are they just going to play a regular system with with Holland back deep and, and Poyer as a kind of the robber and the guy that comes down into the box kind of doesn't feel like that's really what their their plan is going to be it feels like Weaver's going to have something a bit sexier than that and but there are players out there that could fit and and I think fans will be you know if the Dolphins draft Cooper DeGene at 21 I think you know 75% of fans will, will be up in arms because they drafted a white cornerback and you know who is this guy and he's a bit stiff in his hips and this is Jason Seahorn from 2002 if the Dolphins draft Cooper DeGene at 21 he will not be a cornerback completely you know he will not be a cornerback he will be a Swiss Army knife they can use on the back end who can do all sorts. You of think things. he could be twenty one? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Simon, we definitely appreciate your time. Um, for those who want to get your more of your draft takes, uh, draft guide with how many players? Three hundred and how many players? Three hundred and some. I I lost the will to live to count, but there's about three hundred and twenty something like that. Three hundred. Now, do, do you give me the nasty nitty gritty like Nolan the Rocky used to give? Oh, me? there's a lot of nasty nitty gritty in here. There's a lot of nasty near agree. I can, you know. You tell me about lot. baby mamas and and. Uh, there's a lot of baby mamas. There's a lot of well, there's a lot of all sorts of trouble and shooting and murder and happiness and joy and choir singers and bongo players and all sorts of ukulele. Weird. You had you had what Tua played the ukulele in his. In his I had in Tua Africa. playing the ukulele back then. So yeah, there's my mum facetiming me just on uh, just exactly when you need it. Um, yeah, uh, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. So yeah, there's um. There's a lot of things in there. I mean, I was uh, just uh, doing the cleanup today in terms of and, and rereading Ray Davis's story. He's a running back from Kentucky, and this was a kid that was homeless, aged eight. He was, you know, he, he lived on his friend's couches for years. He ended up, he asked if a teacher could look after him for one night. He ended up staying there for three years, and and he played AAU basketball when he was 14, 15, and one of the, the mums felt really sorry for him and ended up taking him in, took him to a got essentially got him a scholarship at a basketball school in new york and here he is in the nfl draft and he'll be a, a day three pick and you know stories like that you, you root for kids like that so and there's a lot of those in the draft book kentucky which one is this so raymond his name's raymond r-e-h apostrophe m-a-n ray davis he'll be a day three pick um okay he's a nice player he's the so he's the first player in sec history to rush for a thousand yards with two different sec teams um Vanderbilt and Kentucky. He's got a degree from Vanderbilt. And this was a kid who literally, he was living in the basement of a hospital for two years as a homeless eight-year-old. His parents were in prison. He was just one of those, he's one of 14, so he's got 13 brothers and sisters. 
and he is just one of the kids that fell through the he was a ward of the state age 10 he was one of the kids that just fell through the fell through the system and thankfully he's been able to make something of his life and his parents have been in prison and his, his parents, i think his dad's now out of prison um and they've rebuilt their relationship so yeah you pull for kids like that definitely uh so how can they get your draft guy simon um i think if you send me a direct message on twitter uh it's at si clancy s-i-c-l-a-n-c-y i also set up an email address which i can now find uh while you're there which is um 2024 nfl draft book that's 2024 nfl draft book all one word at gmail.com 2024 nfl draft book at gmail.com and uh I'll send it to you. All right. Appreciate it. And you could also find Simon on three yards per carry the podcast that actually partners with um, five, uh, five reason sports. So always appreciate your time. Thank you for getting us ready for the draft, Simon. And uh, one prospect, I want one prospect third day. You're banging your fists on the table for. Uh, okay. Uh, Malik Mustafa, who is a safety uh, from Wake Forest. He, he is Bob Sanders. This is a 5'9", 210-pound Bob Sanders clone who flies downhill to the football. He is all gas, no brakes. Uh, he's just a phenomenal player. Great in the slot, solid cover guy, can tackle, brilliant blitzer. I would be banging the table long and hard for this guy. He is a uh, He's a hell of a player. All right. Well, we thank you for your time. We appreciate you, and best of luck with the draft guide. And for everybody, I'd strongly encourage you. I've been leaning on Simon for many, many years. I'm pretty sure we've gone multiple years. We probably... I've uh, been doing this probably 2009, maybe. Yeah, at least that. At least that. Yeah. So thank you again for your time. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow on all Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Bye. guys.